This episode of the Disney Dish Podcast is sponsored by TouringPlans.com, where you can find trip planning tools and advice for Walt Disney World, Disneyland, and Universal Studios Orlando. Disney Dish listeners can subscribe with discount code DISH2013. That's DISH2013. To get 25% off a one-year subscription to TouringPlans.com. Check it out as soon as you're done listening. Thanks! Welcome back to another edition of the Unofficial Guide at Disney Dish Podcast with Jim Hill. It's me, Lantesta, and uh, today we're continuing the series that we started a couple weeks ago on Disney's moderate resorts. And in order to tell that story is the man who has a Yoda-like knowledge of all things Diddy. You notice how I threw in that Star Wars reference because of the popular Star Wars episode we did? It was good. It's Mr. Jim Hill. Jim, how's it going? I thought you said yodel. <laughs> yodel, exactly. He's wearing the yodel. He's got a really That's... long flugel horn. <laughs> Ricola! So, all right. Sorry. Sorry. Um, yeah, I will. No, no. That, that, Thank you for I... getting that reference, by the way. Thank you. Okay. So... <laughs> I know, there's only five of us who get that joke, but that's okay. So, anyway, um, just to, to jump right into it, the, the, the moderate resorts. Michael Eisner always gets credit for starting the Disney hotel building boom. That's not entirely true. In fact, there were plans well in the works when he came in the door as CEO in 84. Um, there's a speech by Dick Nunes where he starts off talking. Uh, this is from spring of 82, before Epcot opened. And he talks about how the greater Orlando Kissimmee area, according to Disney's own estimate, is 15,000 and 19,000 hotel rooms short. And so Disney, you know, says, we're worried about this, so we're going to address it. And at that time, they had three hotels in active design and development. Now, what's kind of interesting is those of you, you know, who have the little souvenir booklet of the, you know, what Disney World was supposed to look at phase one, there's a lot of the hotels, you know, things like the the Thai or the Asian or the Venetian or even the, the Persian that just got booted off of this plan that tastes had changed in the, the decade or so in between, uh, you know, when Disney World opened and when Dick Nunes is, you know, eyeballing what's going to be built. So uh, in the place of the Thai um, or the Asian, uh, we have the Grand Floridian. Uh, in the, the place of the Venetian, we have the Mediterranean that's supposed to be built in that swampy piece of tor- territory between the Transportation and Tickets Center in the Caribbean. And instead of the Persian, which was going to be built on the to the north of the Contemporary, the Imagineers wanted to build a hotel at that point that was called the Cypress Point Lodge, which was going to be the south of the Contemporary. Uh, this was going to be a 550-room, five-story tall hotel right at the edge of Bay Lake, mm-hmm. and it was supposed to be themed as a turn-of-the-century hunting lodge and was supposed to be seen as an extension of the Fort Wilderness Campground and the old uh, River Country's old swimming hole. Now, <laughs> again, what's kind of ironic is... They still went forward with that hotel. My Eisner comes through the door, looks at that plan, but Eisner being Eisner, it can't be five stories. It's got to be seven stories. Can't be 550 rooms. It's got to be 729 rooms. Everything got bigger and grander, you know, when Eisner came through the door. And is that uh, that's what became the Wilderness Lodge? That's it exactly. So, so we also changed the theme from Cyprus, I guess, uh, swampy Florida to uh, National, National Park. Park. Yep, that's it exactly. Okay. Uh, and again, you know, the, the Grand Flow, the Mediterranean, and the Cyprus were all supposed to be relatively high end, mm-hmm. even for the pre Eisner era. And you know, again, you look at this. This so where is where's the hotel for the less affluent Disney World visitor? And and Nunes was going to address this. He, he talked talked about how we have some dreams for the Walt Disney World Village from the Empress Lily, you know, back before Fulton's Fish House, that the, the restaurant that was there. We're going to make a New Orleans Street, and you'll walk right up that to a beautiful New Orleans hotel and remember that idea it's going to be point your port later anyway quick readers digest version here fall of 82 epcot opens underperforms corporate raiders begin to circle the walt disney company you've got saul steinberg erwin jacobs you know preparing a takeover and here come the bass brothers this is a family with big texas oil money uh they buy up a majority of disney production shares they declare themselves the white knight and protect the company from any further hostile bids that point, you know, this is October of 84, uh, the Basses, you know, put Roy E. Disney back on the board of directors and hire Michael Eisner and to be chairman and CEO and Frank Wells president. Beyond that, the Basses really are basically hands off. We trust your instincts. We're putting you in place. We have one request. You know, you have to develop. Disney World has 43 square acres of property in Central Florida. Only 10% of the land had been developed up, up until this point. And it's usually, it's strictly around the Magic Kingdom, Epcot Center, the Shopping Village, and, you know, Hotel Plaza. Mm-hmm. So one of the very first things that, that Eisner and Wells do is they form the Disney Development Company. And this is going to be the corporate arm of the company that handles real estate. And, you know... <laughs> 
you, 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 you're going to love this part of it, Len. This is a quick snapshot of the way things were at Walt Disney World before Michael Eisner got started. So it's October 1984. There are 2,780 Disney-owned ho- owned and operated hotel rooms on property. That's it. Okay. Wow. And they range in price from 105 to $195 a night. Okay. And now, this is in uh, 1984 dollars. 1984 dollars. So there's okay. there there are fewer hotel rooms in Disney in 1984 than there are in just the All Star Resorts now. There you go. Okay. Well, now and, and they cost about the same. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that's that's what cracks you up about this. Okay. All, All right. right. Uh, con- now contrast this. Now, meanwhile, over at Hotel Plaza, yeah, there are more hotel rooms. There's 3,535 hotel rooms, and they rooms range in price. Again, you know, again, this is over at Lake Buena Vista. They, you know, low of seventy dollars a night during the off season to a high of two hundred fifteen during during peak times. Wow. So. You know, and but the reason the basses were pushing Eisner is during this period, during the early 1980s, Disney's owned and operated hotel rooms on property were always more than 90 percent full year round. And even the Lake Buena Vista hotels, on average, were 85 percent full. So, you know, Eisner and Wells were on the job maybe a week and they're already in central Florida. But but here's the thing. They're not just touring Disney property. They're also out scoping out the competition. One night they go out to Church Street Station. The next morning, they do a quick walk through Wet n Wild. That opened in '77, by the way. That the first big size water park after River Country. Hmm. Anyway, whenever people were leaving property, Eisner wanted to know about it. He wanted to know why, and then he wanted Disney to prepare a response. And one of the very last things he did is he had he and Wells' driver go up and down I Drive and go up and down 192 to see what the competition, what those hotel rooms looked like from the outside. So this is this is October, November. This is By, like, sorry, I, don't, I mean this is yep. really hands on. I mean this yep. is like basic research, like you know the, the, this is essentially the uh, the scouting party. Well, you know, this was the thing that he wanted to to get into Disney and get it moving forward as quickly as possible. Mm-hmm. But, and in order to do that, he, you know, that's the thing. Eisner was always hands on. Eisner, I mean, you know, there are these stories about when Universal was being built, how Eisner, on the way from the airport, would always insist that the driver go and drive around the Universal construction site, and Eisner would get out and look over the fence. <laughs> I mean, you know, it just, I mean, you know, he, need, he needed a blog. That's what he needed. No, exactly. You know, just like they, they do these pre-internet days. It was like, I got to know. What are they doing? I got to know. How far along are they? Anyway, so j- we just jump ahead now three months. It's February of 1985, the first annual meeting under, you know, Michael and Frank. And the big news is, you know, a deal with George Lucas. Hey, you know, what a coincidence. That's going to lead to Star Tours. And there's also the drop these rather large hints that Disney MGM is in the works that you know they they mentioned that they've got a major studio tour that they're thinking about for Florida property but you know we haven't committed to it yet and and just it's sort of a fleeting note during Wells's portion of the meeting he you know quickly lays out plans to develop 10,000 acres of Florida land and then that they'll be announcing the master plan by mid-year. That kind of slides. You know, we don't really hear much about what Disney's up to until July of 86, and that's when they announce that they're going to be building Pleasure Island. <laughs> but the thing of it is, is, of course, that in order to build Pleasure Island, that means Dick Nunes's New Orleans-themed hotel goes away. Or does it? Anyway, finally, we get to June of 1987. Wait, sorry, Jim, Jim, real quick. Sorry. So the yep. so they're going to develop 10,000 of the 28,000 acres? That was the plan? Uh, 10,000 of, yeah, of the 28,000 acres. Um, wow. So... Now it's a master plan. You know, oh, okay. The so is, this, okay, sorry, I misunderstood. Okay, so this is. You know, I was like, is they're not even they're not at ten thousand acres now? I don't think. Yeah, you know, just the, the, okay. the whole notion is, you know, they identify areas, and this is the ten year plan, twenty, thirty, got it, forty got it, got year. Build okay, up. okay. So, so they they come up with a, a bold vision, but then yep. so, and they're going to start off with Pleasure Island. Well, that that's the announced. The next thing out of the gate is a simultaneous announcement of the Grand Floridian, a new high end hotel for the around uh, monor the monorail. 
But the news for the less affluent, the people who aspire to stay on Disney property, is the 200-acre Caribbean Beach Resort. Now, construction begins in 87. And kind of, you know, interesting little bend on the story here. This resort actually keys off of plans for a Caribbean-themed pavilion that was considered for World Showcase. But the Imagineers were never able to find a sponsor for the thing. But really? it was, yeah, it was such a cool set of buildings and such a neat design that, you know, when it came time to, you know, spitball resorts, it's like, well, hell, we got this model. Show it to Eisner. And Eisner was, again, a very visual guy, had the sea things, saw the model and said, yep, that's it. Let's go. So I, I, I don't know that I've ever heard of a, a Caribbean Epcot pavilion. Was it was it going to be like in all the island nations, like the Barbados and Jamaica? Well, now remember, you've got upwards of nine, depending on how you count, you've got nine to 11 expansion pads around World Showcase Lagoon. In fact, if you go all the way back to the first iteration of what World Showcase was supposed to look like, the idea was that, you know, you would the pavilions would be so grouped so closely together that you could actually see how the architecture of one region influenced another. And the notion was that, for, for example, the Caribbean Pavilion was actually supposed to be, I've seen one plan where they dropped it over, you know, next to Mexico. Yeah, which, that would make sense, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was, the, you know, the way Disney tried to sell it is they kept going to, you know, the various islands there and trying to sell it as sort of a group project guys. We all put in a buck. You can do this. And it was like, in the end, you know, the, the sad thing is that if there had been, if Norway had been built, and they could, you know, I think we told the story last time about how when Norway opened up, you know, they saw a 400% jump in tourism from the United States because yeah. people would go there and see, wow, this is great. You know, if they, if that had been in place, I bet this would have been a slam dunk with, you know, the, the various, with the Caribbean islands. It would have been, sure. okay, you know, hell, we can set this up and, you know, sell tours right out of here. But yeah. that's not how it worked. But, but again, it's just, they had the art, they liked it. Eisner said yes. And next thing you know, they've hired, you know, Frank. Jay Rooney out of Fort Lauderdale to be their general contractor. Interesting enough, even off after Imagineering had done the initial model, the resort itself was designed by Fugelberg Koch Architects of Winter Park. Uh, they're the guys who broke it down into the five different villages, each with its own theme keying off of a, a Caribbean island. You know, the whole notion is that it's built around this 42-acre lake, and yep. each of the little villages has their own pool. So, you know, they turn the key on it. It's, you know, it's budgeted for $135 million. Wow. How do they uh, how do they pick the uh, the islands that are representative? So I, I, there's no, like, you know, Grand Cayman. Right. How, now, how do they? Well, that's interesting you bring that up. Uh, Wing Chow, uh, who was the executive vice president of master planning, architecture, and design for uh, Disney Imagineering, you know, he, he, he talked about how we were challenged to create the character of famous islands that people could relate to. So what they were looking for were bright colors, landscaping schemes, slopes and textures, you know, they could use that, that would reflect the local traditions of the islands. So, you know, when they, they looked at Jamaica, well, we've got the British influence, you know, we can sure. go off of, and they've got the strong yellow and blues that they do there, and Victorian style architecture. Trinidad is the bird island, so you can do, you know, browns and yellows, and Barbados is the islands of flowers, you know, you know, it's pinks and greens, so it was like, it was relatively easy for them to do, but, you know, but at the same time, when you're staring down the barrel, Disney had honestly never done anything of this size. You know, this hotel complex, just phase one, which was supposed to open in fall of 88, was 600 and, uh, uh, oh, excuse me, 768 rooms. Yeah, that's at, full, at full build out, this resort was supposed to have a total of 2,102 rooms. Wow! So they were they were almost doubling. They were they were increasing by like 80 percent. No, that's exactly the, the, right, wow. out the, <laughs> right, right out of the gate. Right out of the gate. And wow. at the, and the site of this hotel is not an accident. The Caribbean Beach Resort was deliberately placed close to Epcot with the hope that people who were staying there in these 33 two story buildings, mm -hmm. and, it, and each of them had 64 guest rooms in. I'm just, you know, talking a lot of people would yep. either start or end their Disney World vacation, you know, at the, the newest theme park. Um, <laughs> another part of the kind of the tide Epcot that I love is, do you ever wonder what World Showcase Lagoon looked like before the construction crews dredged it out? Was it was it, was it uh, more flat? <laughs> <laughs> it was this pool of muck that had, and if they're digging down, they find this five acre in size root mass. Now, now somebody who's who's just finished building a house, you got to appreciate this. You can walk across five acres, and it's four and five feet thick. 
you know, and it's, it's nothing but organic root matter. Oh my god! Oh, and it's right in the middle of what they want to do. So first thing they try to do is they pour wet sand on it to try to sink it. All right, <laughs> figure, okay, we're gonna bury it all the way. That doesn't work. Okay, so they, they take the sand away and then using lots and lots of heavy equipment haul this root mass off to the southeast. They they take it across what will eventually be Buena Vista Drive and they just sort of leave it where the root mass eventually dries out. And you know, this is what kills me. It, it eventually right dead center where the root mass is is the construction site of the Caribbean Beach Resort. <laughs> is it really? So, it, seriously. So, all you veteran Walt Disney World visitors, when you book a night at the Caribbean Beach Resort, you really are going back to your roots. So... <laughs> Sorry, I, I couldn't resist. It's okay. a little bit of Epcot there, too. That's uh, that's really fantastic. There you go. Anyway, getting back to booking rooms, um, they're still building the place, but it's April of, of two, 1988, and Disney World kicks open the Reservation Center for both the Grand Floridian, which is opening August 1st of that year, and for the Caribbean Beach Resort, which is scheduled to open in November. And again, these, these prices just kind of kill me. The flow, when it opened, you could get a room there. The, the range was from $165 to $240 a night. Okay, Caribbean Beach Resort, listen to these prices, Len. You could get a room for $65, $75, or $85 a night. Uh, yeah, I actually had this as a uh, as a trivia question during one of the reunion events last year, and, and uh, no, everyone guessed high. No one believed that the uh, the starting price was, was $65 plus tax. It was... Yeah, I mean, that just kills me, you know, and now mind you, again, the rooms were small. I mean, yeah, they're, 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 they're still 314 small. 314 square feet, yeah. Yeah, uh, and what? Well, the rooms, you know, the rooms, I mean, the room sizes haven't changed. In fact, they, they haven't even changed the air conditioning system <laughs> since, but I love that, you know, you know, they're, they're the, uh, they're the old motel style mm-hmm. air conditioning, where it's an actual physical unit that hums Mm-hmm. At, at night and and so i like white noise when i sleep i i think that it's just amazing i love the air conditioning at the caribbean beach resort and you know that they, they had the standard amenities for you could put two to four people in a room mm-hmm. you choice between a king size or a double bed and you know what that the standard crap you know the ironing board coffee maker hair dryer you know nothing extravagant and no. back then you know they still offered smoke rooms and they they even yep. were at the forefront they had some disabled accessible rooms yep. and you know the big deal was you know their the gold port rail you know you had your, your your food court you had shutters you had a feature pool the problem with this hotel not to say it was perfect you know right from the get-go it had issues in fact even today there, there are people who have problems with the caribbean beach resort because of the custom house which is... <laughs> that was exactly the question that i was waiting to ask why did they put the custom house all the way over there well you know, the just initially they thought, okay, everybody will be, you know, this is the hotel. No one's flying in. They're driving, driving in. in. Right. It's like, all right, so let's take that into account. And, you know, it just on paper, this seemed like an idea that would work, that you would make, you know, and remember, you couldn't, it wasn't just checking and checking out. This is also where you could drop off dry cleaning if you dry wanted it done. Luggage. Yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, pick up, it, it, pick up supplies and whatever. Yeah. On, on paper, it was a wonderful idea. In reality, it was a pain in the ass, and still is. But anyway, you know, they they kick up on the doors actually on October first. They, they they again, this was a whole other era of Disney history. More to the point, they had Michael Eisner breathing down their neck. So, they actually opened a month early, and you know, they just waited if they got you know the new clientele that they were hoping for, and boy, did they! Oh yeah, uh, you know, February 1989. This place has only been open four months at this point, and from the stage, they announced. The place has been full since opening day, yep. which is why we are now green lighting two additional moderate hotels. That's hysterical. So the funny thing is, is I the first trip I ever took with my sister, uh, just as as an adult, we stayed at Caribbean Beach, and it had just opened, and I we were uh, we were amazed by it. It was uh, you know because we you know, obviously we we're kids, so we couldn't afford to stay at the, the Polynesian or the the Contemporary or anything like that. But the uh, we stayed at the the Caribbean Beach. I remember I remember actually having the conversation with my sister about. You know, hey, I hear you know Disney's open this new resort. You know, and we were we were probably looking at newspapers, mm-hmm. right? Or we were oh yeah, Good. We, or we must have picked up like one of those brochures and, uh, mm-hmm. that you get on the interstate. You know, hey, Disney's opening this up. We should go stay there. And I remember having to call like on the phone to make a reservation. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah there's you know. days. But we stayed there the first year, and it was uh, you know, I, I remember, I remember like it was yesterday. You know, where where we stayed, and uh, you know, the checking in with the customs house, and I thought it was all very fancy, and because mm-hmm. you know, I was like the first, you know, that's actually the first time I'd ever stayed. I think I think it was my first on-site stay was at Caribbean wow. Beach ever. Yeah. Wow. 
No, it, it, I mean, it, it took so a So I'm one of those I, people that was, uh, that was in the crowd. Go ahead. No, I mean, you know, in fact, I, I probably got in there myself just ahead of, I want to say it was in there ahead of the opening of, of MGM. But same thing. I mean, just, you know, it was back in the day. I mean, it's not going to be wrong. They still keep it up. It still looks great. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, it was it was fresh. It was new. I mean, you know, in fact, they, the irony here in February of 89, they still haven't finished it. You know, and already they're announcing that they're building two more hotels. When did they make the decision to build the two more? So it opens in late 88. Mm -hmm. How many, I mean, you're talking about like four months later. They're, they're four months later. Some... And they're just projecting, you know, that they're, they're just looking at the fact that they've got this demand and they, they, you know, people are calling out ahead of time for, you know, the busier signals or busier se seasons and, and more to the point, the people who stay there are going home and evangelizing. You know, they're just telling their friends and that's what they're getting from a lot of the phone calls is I want to stay in this hotel. And, you know, they're already, you know, book, they're already booked out and they just realize that this is going to continue. We, we just, we have to move quickly. And, and in fact, the funniest part of having to move quickly is just like with the Caribbean Pavilion for World Showcase, you don't have time to develop a new idea. So what do they do? They reach to Dick Nunes's old New Orleans themed hotel idea, and that gets pulled out of mothballs and put into active development. Really? You know, I mean, again, just, you know, they don't have the time to waste. When they did that, when they were thinking New Orleans, were they thinking that, because now it's two separate resorts, right? It's Port Orleans Riverside and Port Orleans French Quarter. But it used to be Dixie oh. Landings, right? Well, there you go. And we will get to that story. That's coming up <laughs> fast. But, uh, but same deal, that, that when all these hotel rooms were completed, you know, Disney was going to have over 6,000 moderately priced hotel rooms on property by, nine, you know, the, the end of 1992. You know, and, and again, all aiming toward making sure that the people who stay out on I Drive or out on 192 have the offer, opportunity to stay on Disney property. But of course, the downside of when you build, when you build a resort, it's like building an ocean liner. You start building, you lay the keel in one economy. And you actually launch the, you know, launch the boat in another. And mm -hmm. so, you know, here it is. You know, the Gulf War gets underway in 91. Yeah. And, you know, Disney kicks open the doors of the Port Orleans Hotel in May of 91 in the middle of this really steep downturn in hotel occupancy. You know, they haven't deviated from the playbook. They've still got, you know, Fugelberg Koch, the, the Winter Park people, you know, as they're designing the hotel. Mm -hmm. They're still building close to Epcot. It's just, to, you know, on 320. Acres to the northeast of Epcot Center. Uh, so uh, half, half again as big as uh, Caribbean Beach, two, which was 200 acres. Well, again, remember that eventually this will be two hotels. Oh, right. So it's okay. Yeah. So, all right. Fair enough. But interesting, you can already start to see the price creep. You know, the now remember when Caribbean Beach Resort you know, started taking reservations in April of '88. You know, we're talking 65, 75, 85. So what, parking lot, you know, garden and pool view or whatever that is. Sure. You know, now for Port Orleans, suddenly they start off. Off season is seventy nine, ninety five, ninety nine dollars, mm -hmm. and peak tourist time is eighty five, ninety five, ninety nine. And again, this is at a time when hotel rooms on property are ranging typically from one fifty to three hundred fifty five dollars a night. Um, oh, so uh, so uh, so before they started this construction boom, mm -hmm. the Disney hotels were one hundred and five to one fifty five. Now they're up to three fifty. So Eisner comes in and in four years roughly doubles the the revenue of the hotels. Yeah, that's exactly. Well, but again, you know the. the Anybody who, who's paying attention in this period is watching ticket prices creep up and food prices creep up. And it's mm -hmm. just, you know, it's the old, how do you boil a lobster? You know, just one degree at a time. Yeah. Um, well, eventually and, the price hikes stop, right, Jim? Because they, they wouldn't, they couldn't keep increasing prices for hotels and food and, and <laughs> from 1980 on. I mean. La, 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 not listening, man. <laughs> I live here in reality land. All right, so all right, so the, it's, this thing opens in '89. Now it's a couple of years. It's two years later, right? We're in the middle of the Gulf War. So what, what what's going on with the resorts? They realize, well, you know, I mean that they're still moving forward, and and more to the point, they you know they're making sure that they don't re repeat the mistakes of the Caribbean Beach Resort. You know, you notice, you know, when you you do Dixielanders or Port Orleans, you know, you don't have a custom house. You have, a, you know, your check-in area is right in the center of the hotel, centrally it's, located, right? Yeah, and you know, right next to your food and. Retail. I mean, never again are they going to make that mistake. Likewise, the you know their theme pool is right nearby. Yeah, that's right. The uh, the themed pools are both cent uh, central in both of the, well, central in in 
in French Quarter, in Dixie Landings. In Riverside, it's it's back a little bit, right? It's well, that's it's because relatively you, central, but yeah, you've got the the Old Man Island. I mean, it, yeah. it's it's a hike over a bridge, but it, it's you know it's not it's still pretty central, yeah. Yeah, it, it's not like, for example, at, at at Caribbean Beach, where if you wanted to go to the central theme pool and you're you know out at Trinidad, you know that's, it's you know pack great. a lunch. Is so. there is there any other resort other than Caribbean Beach in which the check in and retail areas aren't centrally located? No, okay, again, you know Disney learned the hard way that people, you know, again, and think about it, it's that last minute impulse buy before you get the car and leave, and in this case, it's you know you're you're leaving and like, oh, I'd like to get a towel or a coffee mug. Well, too bad we're in the car go yeah i said never mind and we're going the wrong way right because yeah there you go so so huh Saratoga Springs is a little bit like that in that you've got those rooms over by uh, uh, the Trias Villas right on the other side of the golf course, but it's still relative. I mean, the check-in area and the retail area is still relatively centrally located. I mean, they are there, but but again, remember the DVC, same thing. They yeah, had, yeah, yeah. They had a real learning there themselves. Oh, so. uh, Old Key West. Speaking of DVC, yeah. Yep. So it's mm-hmm. all the way at the front. Yeah. So so huh. So that's interesting. So when they when they built their first moderate and they built their first dvc they tried something different with the the ha huh, that is really interesting because the, the I, I never knew that before yeah it, the notion was that the people who were buying dvc had been to you know the resort before you know yeah, that, yeah. That, that this wasn't you know something someone would get into cold off the street you know so the notion is <laughs> let's not be so blatant and in their face with this crew and yeah. disney quickly kind of got over that <laughs> with the other dvcs you know i mean just think about how how most guests get to the example of the bay lake towers they've got to walk through that retail corridor at the contemporary huh, okay all right so back to uh, back to 91 so you know, they, they, so they get that first set of rooms open, got 1,008 rooms at Port Orleans. And mm-hmm. by February of 92, we're seeing first phase of Dixie Landings opening up. And, you know, that, you know, same thing. They've got 1,024 rooms opening. You know, that'll eventually all of the other rooms, though, the total, that's 2,048 rooms will be open by June of that year. Still not a coincidence the way this is set up. The, the it's this moderate hotel is close to Epcot to serve as a feeder park for or resort for that hotel or theme park. Mm -hmm. Likewise, it's connected by the canal boats uh, up going the Susquehanna River over to the the shopping village in Pleasure Island. So in essence, you're forcing people to go over there at night to to spend more money. So again, there's there's some ingenious design going on. Did um, Jim, did the the canal linking those properties to downtown Disney exist or did Disney build it? You know, that that's kind of a chair of the egg situation. I mean, if you talk with, you know, Admiral Joe or, you know, General Joe Potter, you know, the, the guys who actually dug all of those canals to help drain the property, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, look, you know, I built these things. In fact, I fought with Walt Disney because I built straight canals. And he bitched and moaned at me about the fact that he wanted it to look naturalistic, which meant I had to go out and build curvy canals, which looked like you know they fit the terrain but you know they sat there you know to help drain the area that they were going to put the the tree houses and the golf courses in so mm-hmm. they were in place so you know disney was able to sort of build on that infrastructure there was some dredging you know leading up to the opening resort to widen waterways and to make sure they were deep enough for the boats to pass but you know th- it was there to build on wow so that's some uh, that's some foresight there yeah you know but but again you talk with you know a guy, guy had an amazing conversation once with Joe Fowler about just, you know, just uh, he, he could literally refer to the filing cabinets that they still had full of plans. And it was very frustrating to him that the Eisner era people wouldn't consult all of the survey work and everything that they'd done. Because it's like, look, we walked every inch of the property. We knew where to build. Just it, it was frustrating for them, for example, when, you know, that they, they, they were pounding the um, – you know, the pilings down where Epcot, they were putting it in. And it's just sort of like, look, we, we knew that we weren't ever going to build there. You know, <laughs> you know, why they built there? But anyway, um, okay, now we, we enter kind of an infamous portion of the um, – the Caribbean Beach Resort story, a somewhat adult story, and I apologize for this, but this had an impact on, on Disney property, so I, I, it's important that it get told. Um, All right, this is Caribbean Beach. Caribbean Beach. Okay, it's Halloween 1992. woman comes back into her hotel room, hears screaming from the room next door, calls Disney security, and this horror story, you know, starts to unfold. Basically, this woman comes back to her hotel room. Uh, another woman, the woman next to the woman who called it in. Mm-hmm. Evidently, 
she enters a room. She's attacked by a man in a Dracula costume, and she claims that this guy beats her, binds her arms and legs to the bed with duct tape, and then rapes her in front of her ten for ten year old daughter. You know, and of course it makes the papers. It's oh yeah, you know, it's all up, gotta be all over the news, sure. Yeah, and so Disney, this is a PR disaster for them. So they immediately change all the security you know, procedures on property. They they install video cameras at all of the entrances and entr- exits to the uh, to the resorts. Uh, you can't get past the guard shack without showing photo id um you know it just it 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 was a very different age um prior to this incident happening anyway jump to june of 93 what a surprise this woman is now suing disney over the 911 response and the fact that security let this man you know get past and get into a room and rape her and it's really looking bad for disney until they get a phone call from and, and this woman's name is wanda normil and they get a they get a phone call from her half sister and basically what this woman tells disney is that wanda and her brother james had cooked this whole thing up it was a hoax it was it, you know, really? they, they were out to extort from disney and just they i mean he literally you know it's I, I won't get into the details other than the fact that you know they they did you know duct tape her down to the bed they they beat the woman to look convincing um anyway wow. jump ahead to 90 may of 94 this woman is sentenced to three and a half years in prison uh i mean it, you know and she not only that she has to pay twenty four thousand dollars in restitution to both disney and the orange county sheriff's office to cover their investigation costs but uh i can't just i just keep, i can't fathom this this is a 21 year old woman and her brother who cooked up this scheme and just you know, and again, we're all paying for it now. I mean, don't you got to remember this was pre nine eleven, and suddenly you have to show a photo ID, and you know there are you know little arms that come down in front of every one of the guard checks. So oh, is that is that why they got installed? That's why they got installed wow. all on the back of this fake rape uh, or this you know claim of rape. Anyway, yeah. speaking of controversies, uh, March of two thousand one. I, again, I, you know, it's just. Living in our kind of Paula Deen age now, I, I guess you know it, it's it's strange to think about this, but you know, the, but but again, names hurt. And in in this case, they were guess who had stayed at Dixie Landings and just felt that this name was tied a little too closely to an unfortunate part of Southern history. And um, and Disney being Disney. Oh, uh, you know, they they chose to react by, OK, you know, starting in March of 2001, all of the signage around that resort that said Dixie or Dixie Landings on it just disappeared. And, you know, then suddenly you had the entire resort becoming, you know, Port Orleans and you had what the Riverside and the French Quarter. Uh, yep. You know, as as of April, inside of a month, they've changed the name. Yep. Um, and. You know, that it's would that have been, you know, would that if that could have only been the, the only problem that Disney faced in 2001? In 2001. So yeah. I remember going there mm-hmm. uh, after 9 yeah. 11, where no one traveled, right? So this is, yeah. you know, we, we, you know, the, so obviously September was, was the, the month in which the, uh, the terrorist attacks occurred. Yeah. We, you know, you could tell by December that something, you know, that obviously something was really off with the the um, the economy. And wasn't it like the next spring that they just shuttered all of uh, French Quarter? Well, it, it, it not only the French Quarter. In August of 2002, they shuttered all of Caribbean Beach Resort. You know, they, that's right. They, so it was like, oh, we're going to refurbish the rooms. <laughs> Now, now this the, 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 you will appreciate this one because you know how they actually typically do this. I mean, every six years they'll do what they refer to as a soft renovation, where the bedding, the curtains, and the yep. fabrics get taken out. And every twelve years they do what they refer to as a hard renovation, where it's new furniture, you know, that sort of thing. But it's always done, you know, kind of a rolling thing. You do, you know, you, you'll try I'm to shut down here, the, yeah. Yeah, that sort of thing. So for them, the way Disney, and, and again, I mean, everybody knew what it was, you know, but what Disney claimed is, well, you know, we're shutting down shutters for refurbishing. And it just, it doesn't seem right to us to keep a resort open when people won't have the, you know, a place to go for kitchen service. So, so we'll just the whole hotel. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, the, the, the fryer was out yeah, that's... At, at shutters. And, you know, we really didn't feel good about letting people go there when they couldn't get deep fried conk yeah. so we're going to shut the entire resort down while we fix that it's going to be about two years wow. <laughs> so, yeah, really specialized actually... german fryer you know <laughs> 
in the states that they shut down from September 8th through the Christmas holidays. But yeah, man, this is it was a tough, tough time. It was, uh, so you know, you know, it was one of the actually one of the first research assignments I ever got for the guide mm -hmm. was I was staying at River at uh, Riverside, mm -hmm. and Bob said, "Well, since you're staying there, see if you can go see what they're actually doing at French Quarter." Oh. <laughs> and, and he's like, well, you know, there's a, there's this bike path. You can just walk along the bike path and sort of detour in and see what they're doing. So I get there, and do you remember what you remember what they had done there to block it off? They had these like semi tractor trailer sized <laughs> planters all along. The, I mean, there's there's like there's absolutely no way if anyone stopped you beyond those planters where you could say. I had no idea what I was doing. Was that what you uh, – that was a barrier? I thought it was decoration. I mean they had laid these things all across the sidewalks. There was black tarp everywhere preventing you. So, But I still managed to walk around you know, and get up into the rooms and, and take a couple of pictures and stuff. But it was like – luckily there was there was absolutely no refurbishment going on. There were no workers. There no, was no. No, I mean, nothing over there. You know, and, and that was the thing. that The Disney was trying – they. They were trying to avoid a panic. They were trying to keep the stock price in place. So they were doing – I mean, you, know, the, you talk with people at the Grand Flow, and you know, they talked about we shuttered entire floors of the hotel and just – never said a word you know and you know they don't get me wrong they 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 you know for example in the case of you know the caribbean beach being shut down for that, that four month period you know they still found work you know elsewhere on property for the 700 employees that were there uh you know but it, you know wasn't necessarily the full 40 hours they got working at the hotel yeah. and you know they had the opportunity to come back and and claim their job once it reopened but it, it really tough times you know um, but anyway, Disney eventually gets past this. I mean, it's it's a lot of you know free dining. It's a lot of buy three get five. But mm -hmm. um, and in the meantime, again, that they're looking at the Caribbean Beach Resort and trying to figure out with so many other hotel rooms on property. And now you know you have the the new class of resorts, the the All Star Musics and the Pop Century and all that. You know, how do you get people to come back here? And um, Oddly enough, you know, you know, it's it's Johnny Depp to the rescue. It's you know, they they closed down the pool at Old Port Real in January of 2008, and when it reopens in September, it's a Pirates of the Caribbean themed pool. And you know, they also you know that summer rethemed most of the rooms in the hotel um, so that they had kind of a theme a Nemo themed overlay, whether it was the bedspreads or the you know the bunting in the room and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but they, they were still staring down the teeth of the fact that the Trinidad uh, rooms, which are the 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 the, the sixth village that they built uh, when they get full build out, and were just so far out that you know whenever they offer them to guests, it's just sort of like I mean they look and it's like you know it's a, this huge hike to the food court and the swimming pool, and nobody wanted to stay there. They're like the so, very very extreme end of the uh, of the of the property. So what they decided to do is okay, Johnny Depp to the rescue again. They take the you know the all the rooms in that end of it over eight months, and you know they change them out. The bed frames become pirate ships, and the dressers are now crates and treasure chests. And you know, uh, you know, you've even got a picture of Depp up in the room. And suddenly, these 384 rooms go from being you know in Siberia to you know. Um, you know that they actually are so in demand. Disney's able to bump the price to charge it the night per night by thirty bucks, and people still, still, you know, want to pay to get in. Yep. So, anyway, I gonna just it's you know it, to be honest, my favorite aspect of the Caribbean Beach. You know, I've stayed there a number of times over. God, is it really twenty? No, 25 years? 88. 88, okay. so uh, 20, 25 years. Wow. <laughs> oh, God, Lynn. Suddenly I feel very old. Wow, it's been 25 years. Okay. Well, wow. Okay. Uh, this, uh, okay. This episode is sponsored by Geritol and <laughs> Docolax. <laughs> Actually, my favorite part of the Caribbean Beach Resort was actually look, and again, in in the Len Testa tradition of, you know, what barrier, um, you know, <laughs> that off of Cayman Way. Now I got to caution you, folks. This is not there anymore because I looked. Um, but, <laughs> but if you make if you made a left 
off of Cayman Way back in the day, there was this this cast member only road. And if you drove up this cast member only road, um, there around the curve were the prototype buildings. I know, I know exactly the road you're talking about. <laughs> there we go. Okay, it now leads to the laundry facility. Yep, you know yep, the, yep. the the you know the one that's shared between uh, you know Caribbean Beach, Pop Century, and and you know Art of Animation. But they had this is where they would do the prototype building. So you'd go back there. I mean, for example, I've got pictures of this. The 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 sample room for All Star Music where they had the giant maraca draped over you know the room. And I remember going back there you know once seeing all sorts of uh, textures and treatments for uh, Animal Kingdom Lodge. And, you know, at one point, you know, one room that was done up is Coronado Springs Resort. And what was interesting is, again, Eisner, you know, as handsome as he was, you know, when he came to Florida and they were getting ready to sign off on a resort, Michael wanted to sleep in a sample room. So, you know, he would go, you know, he'd drive up in, you know, the, the, the town car and, you know, the security would sit outside the room all night while Michael slept in the room and tried the towels and, you know, he had to actually experience before he signed off on it. Um, But, you know, um, sadly, and again, there are stories to tell about all-star music, you know, the, the, the movies, the the sports and the, likewise the Coronado and pop century and certainly art of animation, but that's going to have to wait for another Disney dish podcast. So we'll do the, uh, we'll do the value source on another episode. That's fantastic. So, So, Oh, that was uh, that's great. So I, I didn't uh, I, actually I'd heard that story about uh, about Eisner yep. staying in the hotels. It's nice to hear that it was uh, it's true. So yeah, he, he was a micromanager, but uh, oh no, but totally, he, totally. You know that that's he. And again, that's you know part of what you know we all loved about Michael Eisner, and at the same time, what we all hated about the guy. I mean, it was just it was one of yep. these things. You know, it's a very different company under Iger. You know, the, the only time Bob steps in is when things are going south, which. I would imagine there's some interesting conversations going on with the Lone Ranger people right about now. Um, <laughs> so. I was going to say that you notice that the Coronado Springs is not going to get a Lone Ranger overlay. Yeah, and yeah I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't. <laughs> I wouldn't count on the the Big Thunder project going forward either. Which is uh, that's a shame. Uh, which is a shame. So. All right, all right, Jim. Well, thanks very much for your first time. We'll have to do the Valley Resorts on a uh, on another episode. Yeah, that would be fun. All right, folks, thanks very much for listening to the Unofficial Guide at Disney Dish podcast with Jim Hill. Don't forget when you're done listening to leave us a rating on iTunes and definitely let us know other uh, episodes that you'd like us to do because we definitely take your suggestions. Absolutely. We're a bunch of short order cooks over here. <laughs> so. <laughs> would, you like, would you like fries with that? There we <laughs> go. This is Len Testa for Jim Hill. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you on the next show.